you can have a sort of sense of yourself as um, that doesn't match reality and it becomes a crutch, you know, and then you, any ex experience that, where that self image gets punctured is then really painful. I think you have to experience it early on. So uh, I thought I'd go way, <clears throat> way inside baseball uh, to start. I was flipping back through the book. I must have read the book in college because I, I, I have the, uh, I, I have like a, a used college edition that I don't remember, but um, I, I read it many years ago. And as I was going back through, there's this one little section where you talk about some of the, how you got all your tools or how you paid for all of them or something. And then you mention um, a grant that you got that was originally supposed to be for a book about Plutarch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to nerd out about this because I would love to read that book. So tell, tell me what that was. And uh, let's talk about Plutarch. Wow. Okay. Um, that's it's been uh, 20 years, but I'll, I'll try. So, yeah, I was at the University of Chicago. I was writing a, a, a dissertation, PhD, on... Um, on ancient political thought, and Plutarch became intriguing to me because, well, for a number of reasons, but for one thing, he's writing at this time, uh, he's, he's writing around 100 AD, just to put it in perspective. So this is a time when, uh, you know, Rome rules the world, obviously. This is sort of the peak of, of Roman Empire. And he is a Greek, and the Greek cities have been subdued by Ro Roman rule, which is a little hard for them because they, of course, thought of themselves as the real ass kickers uh, of the world. You know, sort of the Athenian empire was the sort of this shining moment that they're clinging to. And uh, Plutarch finds that the whole political psychology of the Greeks is kind of obsolete. Uh, they cling to this idea. They tend to engage in a lot of sort of factional fight amongst themselves in these uh, Greek cities. And that just invites the Romans to come and put it down brutally. So he's kind of saying as a um, subject people, you need to reconsider what uh, courage looks like, what... Um, what love looks like. And that's where it got really weird and interesting. And that became the focus of the dissertation. Interesting. No, I, I think what, what jumped out at me is like, if I was to think of like what philosopher or writer I might suspect that someone like you would be really into, Plutarch might be at the top of my list. Just, hmm. And I don't know what I have to base this on, but I feel like Plutarch was sort of a much more hands-on philosopher, even though he was Greek, it didn't feel like he was, um, you know, sort of very abstract. He was very practical. I mean, even just the fact that he was interested in the philosophy of like political life, like philosophy for the actual ruling of an empire, as opposed to merely the philosophy of ideas, that there, there always seemed to me to be a, an immensely practical and down-to-earth grittiness to Plutarch. I like that because it fits with his method, right? About half of his corpus consists of these lives, uh, these yes. biographies that he wrote. So it's a very sort of sociological and um, sort of phenomenological approach. How do, how do the permanent problems of existence show up within a particular life. And it's, um, I think it's not merely a pedagogical uh, kind of device. I think, I mean, I, I've tried to, I, I guess, emulate him in that sense of treating the concrete as, um, you know, sort of the way into um, the most important questions, because if, you know, if it doesn't sort of manifest concretely somehow in life, then I guess there's a risk of just kind of going off into some kind of mental masturbation. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's like, um, he's an anthropologist writing Good. philosophy. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and and he does seem to be uh he, I, the, the, when he's talking about really simple uh simple's the wrong, wrong but when he when he's talking about down to earth the lives that i think really sing from plutarch are cato when he's talking about the spartans you know they they he, he's really interested in the sort of active uh real i mean they all tended to be guys but he he's interested in in like the guys guys of philosophy maybe you know there's no uh plutarch's lives of socrates he's interested in cato or uh you know leonidas or something like that mhm right somehow it's in in the active life of public engagement that um I don't know that we see the man in full. Yes. Right. And uh, someone has to put their, you know, if they have a claim to wisdom, well, let's let's see how it plays out in the real world. I think the problem of self delusion is really uh, has to be kept front and center for any thinker. Um, you can wander into a kind of garden of, you know, self consistent fantasy uh and you know to to bring it into the world of deeds uh offers a kind of check on your own subjectivity and ultimately uh plutarch has to sort of practice what he preaches in that he's uh he's a politician he's like mayor or governor of sort of some some province right he actually is uh in a position of leadership as opposed to just uh a writer about leadership ultimately yeah, he was he was a man of affairs and um yeah, I don't, you know, you may know more about his actual life than I do. I didn't I didn't make that a focus. But although it would have been, you know, someone should write a life of Plutarch. That's what I was hoping you were writing when I saw that. <laughs> yeah, so that would yeah, it sort of gets at the uh the figure of the the public intellectual who yeah. Well, I think what I liked so much about your book and so much about your writing, and I think that's also what I like about Plutarch, is is the idea that philosophy is not what happens in philosophy class, that actually life is the philosophy class. Or as you're saying, you know, shop class is, is where you work on your soul. Um, how did you sort of come, I, I imagine you, you studied philosophy, how did you come to think of philosophy as something very different than I, I would say most people or most of your peers uh, do think about it. Well, I think it was just a, a kind of set of accidents in a way. <clears throat> I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel very well suited to being a professor. Um, I didn't, it, it never really appealed to me, but, you know, I just felt this urgent need to read the most important books and to do so with guidance, uh, with teachers um, and to have a kind of apprenticeship in thinking. Um, but, you know, I, I, uh, there's such a glut of PhD. So there I am trying to get a, you know, a professor job with everybody else. And I never, it wasn't a fully sincere effort on my part to, to get such a job. So I worked at a think tank for a little bit and hated that. And uh, so that's when I quit to open the bike shop. And that turned out to be, for a while, you know, um, a pretty good thing. I guess at that point, I felt more like a kind of dissident uh, thinker kind of outside the system. And that's a great, I mean, it's, it's a precarious position to be in. If you're, But on the other hand, it's very freeing because you're not... You know, you're not trying to please some tenure committee or peer-reviewed journals or something like that. And to my taste, academic um, thought has gotten quite constricted. And I guess there's a couple of problems. One is a professionalization, uh, which is inherently kind of, you know, policing the boundaries of a discipline. And the other, of course, is the politicization, where it seems like everything has to somehow support the regime, you know, broadly understood. Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. 
That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something we're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it, all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it until I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. Yeah, it, the, the professionalization of philosophy is interesting to me because so many of the great philosophers in the ancient world, philosophy was the hobby and uh, there was some actual profession through which they were understanding and applying the philosophy, whether they were politicians or whether they were generals, whether they were, um, you know, advisors or diplomats or whatever. Um, they, it's like they had philosophy w is not supposed to be the job, right? The you're supposed to have a different job that helps you understand the the philosophical ideas. Yeah, well, a moment ago, you used the word anthropological, and I think that's right. I mean, to, you know, to be a knower of human beings requires intercourse with human beings. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's not a faker intercourse than the academic classroom setting, right? Where Well, I, 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 well actually, I want to pull back now from, from that thought because – I think at its best, the seminar room can be a pretty magical place. Um, I think you have to have a kind of rare teacher in a rare environment where the students feel that um, the most urgent matters are at stake. And we, we are creating an environment here of respect and seriousness and um, and really searching. And I've had, I've had seminars like that and they were really uh, something. No, no, I, <clears throat> I agree that the classroom is a way to teach. I'm saying that the professor, uh, that can't be their primary lens through which they understand and interact with human beings. Like, so I think when you look at the ancient world, it's, it's, the, um, it's their experiences out in the world that then qualifies a person to speak philosophically. Right. So your, your idea of intercourse, like you're you're running the motorcycle shop, you're dealing with yourself, you're dealing with the machines, you're dealing with the customers. This is giving you a lens through which to understand the world that you then communicate in the book. With, a book is academic. A if you're teaching a class on shop classes, soul craft, that, that would be fine, too. But it, it, you couldn't have discovered what you discovered in the setting in which you, you know, in the book itself, you had to go out and do something. Yeah, I think an, an iterated process of um, kind of acting in the world and reflecting upon it in a kind of dialectic is how you kind of close in on some kind of insight. The, the action provides a kind of check on, again, this tendency toward sort of self-enclosure and fantasy. Um, but also ex experience in the world is always ambiguous and requires interpretation and reflection. And that's where other people can become very helpful interlocutors uh, who will help you kind of clarify your own experience by talking it through, considering it from different angles. Yeah. I, th I think about this, like <clears throat> I have this, this little bookstore here in Texas. I, I had a marketing business for many years, although I would be writing to a, a large general audience it was often those individual one-on-one -on -one interactions with a troublesome client or with you know, the fact that uh, I've got to repair the roof on the building or, or whatever. It, it's like the things that I'm experiencing then allow me to have a sort of a specificity that I can generalize out in the writing. So I've got to imagine as you're working on someone's motorcycle or something or you're, you're, you're dealing with some issue, that's then informing what you're writing or thinking about. 
Yeah. I mean, it's all a big mess. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, you try to make sense of it. That's, I think that's what writing is good for is like taking the big mess of experience and thought and trying to impose a coherence on your life. I mean, if, if your writing has a, you know, an autobiographical element in it, then it's becomes this attempt to almost create a work of art out of, out of a life that while you're in it always feels, um, you know, you're fixated on the future or regrets about the past and um, to bring it into view as a kind of whole that makes sense. That's, I guess that's the, the task of, uh, of living all together. Does writing feel like a craft to you? Like, is, is there something similar to sort of working on machines and then trying to solve the puzzle that is a, a piece of writing? Uh, I would say so in this, in this sense that, um, you know, in, in what I really loved when I quit the think tank job and started the bike shop, you know, think tanks are, they're inherently sort of corrupt because, you know, somebody's paying the bills and they want, you know, you start with conclusions and then come up with the arguments that that support them. Um, Whereas in fixing motorcycles, you know, either the bike starts and it runs right or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you can't weasel your way out of the fact. You can't sort of interpret it away. So there's a reality principle that you're held responsible to. And writing for me is very much like that. Um, I don't want to merely write, you know, elegantly or something like that or eloquently, um, but to really get at uh, truth, I guess. I mean, it it sounds pretentious maybe to say so, but uh, so it's a very, um, it's it's a pain, it's a painful process. I, I love writing, but it's also just really hard work. I mean, I throw away probably 75% of what I write. Yeah, and I think there's also the the commercial element one might think is corruptive, but is actually, I think, important. So yeah, if, if the, the bike doesn't work, the customer doesn't pay you, like it, you know, the, the, the system doesn't work. I think there's something I've always found to be a bit alienating and weird about a lot of professional philosophy or you're reading some book and it's it's obvious that the the idea of the reader never occurred to the person writing it. You know, they they sort of comfortably wrote a book uh, knowing that it would sell 200 copies, right? The idea of like making something that worked for regular human beings who might want to apply these ideas in their actual life sort of doesn't occur, I think, too often in academia, not just philosophy, in, in all elements. And so to me, and I think your books are a testament to that, when you can get something that works, that then appeals to people who who don't read books about philosophy, that's like one of the toughest puzzles there is to is to crack. I mean, you you wrote a best selling book that has the word soulcraft in the title. That's a that's a pretty tiny target to 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 hit. That that's not easy to do. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, so the idea of commercial viability. Uh, for philosophical writing is an interesting one. Um, I think I think you're right that if you're getting at something um, real, one hopes that that will be accessible to a lot of people and therefore you know maybe viable commercially. But then there's this other question that kind of overlays that, and that is what is valued in the marketplace. And that isn't necessarily line up with, you know, your aspirations as a writer. I mean, there is such a thing as, you know, kind of just kind of trying to pander. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, these, these two things, I think you, you hold intention and you're, uh, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I feel like I've never dumbed anything down. Uh and that's, I guess I'm, I'm proud of that. Also, it just, it doesn't, it wouldn't come naturally to me. It'd be painful to give something less than the most, you know, the subtle and finesse uh, and hard um, account that I can. Uh, but somehow the, the process of clarifying my own thought tends to produce something that, you know, 
is clear enough, I guess, that, that other people can can dig it. No, that that calling that attention, I think, is well said is probably a little bit like Aristotle's mean, where it's sort of <clears throat> something in between doing it exactly the way you want to do it and then doing it in a way that is considerate mm-hmm. or respectful of where the audience is and and how that idea can be made accessible and usable for them. I think it was Epicurus who said, vain is the word of the philosopher which does not heal the suffering of man. I think you could have a pretty expanded definition of what what heal or suffering is. But I think the idea is that the the purpose of the writing uh, should be to have an impact on actual people's lives. And that is easier said than done. Yeah, and you you mentioned suffering. Um, so right, there's a kind of therapeutic um, impulse, I think, in a lot of Stoic thought and um, and some of the other schools, um, sort of that were around the same time, the, the Cynics and the Epicureans. Um, and it's funny we're living at a time right now where I think the idea of you know. Uh, sort of fragile selves in need of um, therapy has become so prevalent. It's really, um, I, I think, distorted our view of ourselves as being uh, kind of a, a very little capacity to endure adversity. Yeah, resilient. Uh, we don't seem to be a particularly resilient population at the moment. It's very fragile and uh very averse to anything challenging or uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, one thing I've, I've written about is what I call safetyism. Um, there's this weird dynamic wherein the safer we become, the more intolerable any remaining risk appears. And I think, so there's a kind of w- strange feedback loop there. And I think one way to, to, to try to understand it is that it, that dynamic gears into a whole set of material interests, right? We have, you know, the helping professions who are determined to make us think of ourselves as, uh, you know, in need of, uh, of help and as, as fragile. And then there's the whole therapeutic state that's kind of, you know, think about the whole COVID regime where we've had this, Um, extraordinary extension of expert jurisdiction over every domain of life that seems like a consummation of this longer trend of kind of giving up our own judgment to to experts and sort of giving up on the idea that we can uh, kind of determine what's appropriate risk for ourselves. But don't you think part of that is because uh, one cannot determine uh, in something like a pandemic, it's very difficult to separate one's personal risk tolerance with the consequences of those decisions on other people. Yeah, right. It's a it's a kind of collective action problem yes. because it's contagious, very much so. And right, none of us are ep- epidemiologists, so there's there's necessarily a certain amount of deference. Uh, this incumbent on us, but what what's so extraordinary is we've seen how the kind of um, apparatus of science has been bent toward purposes that don't this at times seem flatly anti scientific, and it's it's this um, phenomena where science, you know, with a capital S, has been pressed into duty as authority, and if you think about it. You know, science as a mode of inquiry is almost, um, you know, the whole idea of authority is anathema to it. It's a sort of freedom of the mind. That, so it's like it, science has to become something more like a religion in order to serve the function that we've assigned it. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. I wonder how much of this is a result of different, of different entities uh, abdicating their duty, thus forcing other entities into inappropriate roles. So like the reason the judiciary is so political is because the legislatures have ceased to do their jobs, right? Or the reason that um, companies 
uh, like the, a corporate culture is now politicized and companies are woke or whatever you want to call it is because the employees in those companies are frustrated that they can't affect political change through the ordinary means, right? And so I guess my point is that when when the legislatures or the president or also just like basic human beings abdicate their responsibilities or obligations to each other, it forces that energy to go to inappropriate places. And uh, I wonder if really a lot of the trouble we're having is because nobody is doing their job and then inappropriate entities are stepping stepping up and trying to, to fill that breach. Yeah, I think we've seen a, a fairly wide-ranging transfer of sovereignty from democratic decision-making to technocratic bodies that operate really quite insulated from the pressures of democratic politics. Um, and this actually relates to the theme. So my, my most recent book is titled Why We Drive, and it you know, it, it like the first two books, it's it's about individual agency. So the the polemical hook that I kind of open with is the prospect of driverless cars. And you know, human beings are actually pretty good at driving. And it's pretty impressive feel- considering it's not like something we evolved to do. It's it's kind of magical. Well, yeah, and there's actually some great cognitive science on our capacity to mutually predict one another's behavior as this kind of evolved capacity of our brains. And it's, it's kind of scaffolded by social norms that help us predict one another's behavior. And if you're ever in an intersection in Rome or Bombay uh, and you see, you know, this, these unregulated intersections where, you know, there's no lines, there's no lights, there's no curbs, there's no nothing. And you've got buses and, you know, donkeys and uh, cars and bicycles and pedestrians all just kind of finding their way through. It's it's actually can be beautiful to behold. You're 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 witnessing the human capacity for an improvisational sort of cooperation. And I but, the, but when this you know when one of these tech guys. Um, looks at that, he, he's horrified because it looks chaotic. It looks right. messy. Uh, there was this episode where an experimental self-driving car by Google came to an intersection. It was a four-way stop. And so it came to a full stop and waited for the other cars to do the same before proceeding. So it's following the rules. But of course, that's not what people do. You know, they kind of roll up on the intersection, see what the situation is, maybe roll through. There's ambiguous cases of right of way. So what do we do? We make eye contact. Maybe someone gives a little nod or waves the other person through. But the Google car just got paralyzed and it sort of melted down. (laughs) And what was interesting was that the guy in charge of the experiment said that what he had learned from this is that human beings need to be less idiotic. Now, of course, what he meant by that is we need to behave more like robots, uh, be rule followers. And it completely invisible to him was this distinctly human form of intelligence. And I think, uh, you know, the, the ambition to do away with ne- the necessity of that kind of um, intelligence is politically significant. Um, Tocqueville, when he went around America, was very impressed with the observation that it's in these sort of everyday practical activities requiring cooperation that the democratic character is formed, the ability to work things out among ourselves. I was uh, I was thinking about what you said about safetyism. I, I dropped my my five year old off today at he goes instead of going to kindergarten he goes to what's called like outdoor nature school, and it's an outdoor school. Uh, there's no desks or chairs, and they just they play, but they they go on hikes and they learn things. And they have lessons, and as I was dropping them off, uh, you know there was uh, a fire like in in the in the campground. There's a fire which sort of makes you a little uncomfortable as a parent. The the teacher's, you know, shaving, kindling with a very sharp knife, and then she's setting it down on the thing. There's 
trees that could fall and cliffs and mud and water and stuff. And there was an, a part of me that was uncomfortable because as a parent, all you want is your kids to be safe all the time. And then the other part of me that was like, this is so amazing and so perfect, such a better actual preparation for the world. And then the other part of me was sort of chuckling at the fact that, you know, sure, there are dangers from the things I just said, but also in the middle of a pandemic, being outside all day instead of being in a small effectively windowless, poorly ventilated room is also much safer. So I, it, it also strikes me that oftentimes in the name of safety, we actually do things that are profoundly unnatural or unsafe, and we just get normalized to them so they don't strike us as odd. Yeah, I think I think one problem is that we get fixated on one danger in particular and sort of a tunnel vision and, you know, so by way of comparison, if every hundred yards as you're driving down the road, there was a giant flashing billboard that said how many traffic deaths there have been this month, well, people would just, you know, just stop driving. And that's kind of, I think, what we've seen in the pandemic. I mean, the whole media and bureaucratic a uh, symbiotic sort of ecosystem has fixated on this one thing. And we sort of lose sight of the fact that we accept all kinds of risks in daily life that are comparable in their likelihood. So, um, you know, so the lack of a kind of ho holistic picture of the risks that we are that we take on just for the sake of living and doing meaningful activities. Um, yeah, that's, that's for real. Yeah, the, the other thing the pandemic has done for me is just to, to maybe the flip side of what you're just saying is, yeah, we, we were normalized to a whole bunch of risks that maybe uh, that, that looking at afresh give us a different perspective. So for instance, we get uh, very concerned, I don't know, vaping comes out. So someone invents vaping and we're very concerned with all the deaths, uh, you know, or uh, negative health uh, benefits uh, to say vaping, which I'm sure are real and I, I wouldn't vape and wouldn't want my kids to vape. But, um, you know, if alcohol was invented today, we would be horrified by it, right? So there's all these things oh, that yeah. that we've just become normalized to that have existed for a very long time. They're sort of just functions of society that are totally and utterly insane uh, yeah. if, you, if you had any kind of perspective about them. Yeah, and there's also, you know, there's, there's institutional opportunity in picking out one risk and, you know, and kind of um, out of context in such a way that it becomes really scary because that that's what facilitates this kind of transfer of agency. Uh, well, both sort of individual judgment to experts and politically from democratic decision-making to technocratic ones. So it's not like all of this is completely innocent. Yes. There, there is um, a political dynamic to it. Well, the other thing I think about with COVID, so like, you know, I think the death toll is like, 1,200 to 1,500 a day, which is, is horrifying when you think about it. But that's roughly about how many people or, or less than like die of heart disease. So all the arguments that you hear about like, hey, um, you know, this is a public health crisis. This affects all of us. Nobody has the right to overrun the hospital system, et cetera. And then you're sort of like, wait, we've become very passively accepting of a rolling public health crisis, the number one cause of death in the United States, heart disease, that we've just accepted as being normal and uh, you know a, a byproduct of modern society, which you know if we were to focus the amount of energy that we focused on COVID, if, if we really address the root causes of that issue, would also have a transformative you know, impact on society. And, and a, a lot of the same moral arguments that people are making about COVID protocols and public health responses to that uh, could be addressed to other public health crises that are just as important. Yeah, I think, I mean, standing behind all of this, uh, I think, is the fact that we modern people uh, have a hard time accepting death, I mean, just the reality of it. 
right? This is all a kind of frantic um, <laughs> evasion of this existential fact that, that we are going to die. But, you know, to say that, of course, is not to be pro-death and to say, you, you know, <laughs> don't, don't try to, uh, you know, be, uh, maximize your health. But it is to kind of point out that um, it, these risks being, we have very little perspective on them. And I think to, um, to live well necessarily involves uh, accepting risk. That's um, right. To try to eliminate risk is to have a kind of half-life. Um, I mean, <laughs> you mentioned alcohol. I certainly wouldn't want to live without it. No, it's, it's funny, though. Like, uh, we are terrified of death and then profoundly unhealthy day to day. And those, the, mm-hmm. those two things are not just in tension with each other, but very unhealthy or, or very uh, hypocritical. So it's like if you're so afraid of risk and so afraid of death, um, you know, what are you doing stuff in your face with the, this junk food that will inevitably kill you uh, prematurely, yeah. uh, no doubt. So it's funny how you would think if you were, if you were rationally terrified of death, you'd live a very antiseptic, uh, yeah. uh, aesthetic uh, healthy existence, but that's not what most people do. Most people live recklessly with their individual choices and then go, someone should take care of this for me. Mm. So in the, in the most recent book, why we drive, I talk about the spirit of play, which is very much connected to, um, risk taking and the the tension of not knowing how things are going to come out, you know, in, in sport and, um, there's a Dutch historian, uh, Johan Huizinga, who wrote beautifully about play as the basis of civilization, that it's sort of the origins of social order, uh, playing games. You know, they have some rules, and within that, those rules, it's, uh, it's a contest for honor. Um, and you can't have play without putting something at stake, you know, without without risk and, and not very often it's a risk of, of physical harm. And, you know, that spirit of play is what gives rise to culture. So uh, I, what I loved most about, about your uh, shop classes, soul craft book, I guess you're not technically outside cause it's a, uh, you know, you're in a shop usually, but there does seem to be something special about being outdoors or at least not in a perfectly uh, sanitized uh, modern office building. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't, I've, I've had a few office jobs and there was just like something physically like, I can't do this. I cannot sit here. Uh, and I think, you know, there's, a lot of us are simply built that way. And I think there's a lot of kids sitting at school, just bored out of their freaking minds. Um, because, you know, the, the disposition of a scholar is a fairly rare thing. That's not the typical human way. And so the idea that you're going to learn by sitting in a chair and reading a book or looking at a screen is a fairly novel and unusual idea. And so what do we do? Well, we medicate kids with Ritalin so we can get them to sit there to try to make up for the fact that this is a, a fairly unnatural um, situation we've created for ourselves. Yeah, I was I was reading uh, the safety protocols at this, this gym uh, and it was like, you know, everyone inside the gym must wear a mask, you know, because of the pandemic. This is a while ago. Um, it's like, except if you're doing the car, except if you're doing cardio, like on a treadmill. So the pre- first off, the preposterousness of like, that's like the one thing you would not, that's where you're breathing out the most <laughs> aerosols. But, it, but I was, I just remember thinking, you know, you can run outside, right? Like you're aware <laughs> that you can do this activity outdoors and not just that you can do it outdoors. It's much better outdoors. Like why, like running on a treadmill is terrible or, or walking on a treadmill is terrible. And so, yeah, it strikes me as we take all, we have all these wonderful things being outside, going for a walk, going for a run, you know, and then we find a way to do them 
in an inferior way <laughs> indoors. Yeah, there was um, early in the pandemic, there was a, a meme going around. I only heard about it, but apparently it was a picture of a, a Peloton class that was being, you know, so it was on these stationary yeah. bikes, but it was being held outdoors, <laughs> right. of course, because of the pandemic. <laughs> and the caption was, you know, something like, they're on the brink of a great insight. Yes. <laughs> Meaning they're going to go, oh, we wait can a put minute. wheels on these things. <laughs> we can actually go somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's one of like the, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, the pandemic was sort of this forced lifestyle experiment and, you know, working from home instead of a long commute and blah, 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 is I think a big breakthrough for a lot of people. But it was like, hey, you know, working out of my driveway with a kettlebell is a far uh, superior way of doing it, whether I'm doing it at night and I'm looking up at the stars like I was last night, or I'm, you know, doing it in the in, in the middle of the summer and feeling the sun on me. Um is this better than than going into the some basement of a building in New York City and uh, you know uh, getting sweaty with a bunch of random people who who by the way none of us are communicating we all have headphones we're all pretending that right. we're alone and right. like it's just it's just uh, I think there's something special about being outside. It's like we've we've trained ourselves into a kind of dependency on like having an official you know pl- designated place. Yes. Yeah. Like, like that's kind of pathetic. <laughs> I think it was Nietzsche who said that only ideas had while walking are of any worth. I, to me, phil- philosophy and walking are impossible to separate. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And then I, I is is uh, when you would work in the garage. Is, is is it a solitary experience for you? Like, is there something to the solitude of it that's valuable? Uh, both valuable and hazardous, I think. Yeah. I ended up just like ranting out loud to myself and, uh, um, I I feel like I I should probably, I've had people working with me at times and it's, it's good. Uh, it's, it was good to have other people to check your own thinking off and, you know, come up against problems and, and get stumped. But, uh, yeah, I'm in there mostly just, uh, you know, ranting at the radio or something like an old fart. Yeah, I think I think uh, like getting lost in there. There is something that flow state, the solitary flow state, where you forget what time it is, you forget what's happening, uh, you forget everything but the task in front of you. To me, that's like that's like peak performance as a human being. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you get that when you're, when you're working or is it, is it, you're so, uh, yeah, it's a fleeting experience. There are times, usually it's, so I do a lot of metal fabrication. Um, and it's usually in those, uh, you know, especially if I have something a little bit repetitive, you know, like, you know, set up a jig and drill a whole bunch of the same hole. You know, I wouldn't want to do that all day, every day. But when there is a kind of stretch of time in front of me where I know just what I'm doing and I'm all set up, you get a certain rhythm and I feel my whole body relax. And uh, those are really nice moments to be relieved of, you know, having to constantly... um, there's a lot of just, it's thinking, uh, working. It was very cognitively demanding, but those stretches of time where I can just go a little bit on autopilot are just really nice. Yeah. It's kind of like that Zen idea of chop wood, carry water. You're just sort of doing it. It's a little more complex than chopping wood and carrying water, but just like, I find like fix, uh, when I'm checking or fixing fences on my, on my ranch, it's, it's like a very menial, menial manual task but you just sort of get into it because it's so repetitive, like you're saying. Mm, mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, the idea of rhythm, like bodily rhythm, yes. I've become aware is is really valuable. And if I sort of step outside and ask myself, what what would I look like to a an, an observer? Do I look relaxed? Do I look natural and comfortable in what I'm doing? That's kind of a, a good sort of check to take and okay, how can I arrange my, my workspace to be more, 
I don't know, just more Zen or something. Yeah, I think that I, to me, that comes back to walking. I think like as a sort of a nomadic species that was meant to cover long distances, I think that rhythm, because I definitely feel tapping, in, I'm tapping into that when I'm walking. Like if I go for a long walk, I think that's the body sort of getting into that like space where you're, you're, you're effectively traveling, even mm -hmm. if you're staying yeah. still. Somehow what you just said made me think of sometimes when I'm watching like really top musicians, you know, like total masters, the relaxation in their body is like total. It just looks like so effortless. I'm, I just recently watched um, this bass player, Edgar Meyer, and, you know, it's this giant instrument. Uh, and he's a big guy, but it's almost like it's been incorporated into his body. So those really high notes, you know, way down on the neck that require a lot of pressure if you've ever tried to play a bass, but it, it just looks like he's barely touching it. Well, that's what's so, so interesting about music. And I guess a lot of the creative things is, is it's, it's a cognitive task, but then it's also a physical task like metalworking or something, right? Like it, you, 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 there's the physical component of, of the mechanics of actually doing it. And then there's also the inspiration and the creativity and the expression. And it's yeah. when those two things become perfectly entwined with each other that I think you get the magical stuff. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, first you lay the groundwork with endless hours of practicing scales as a kind of, submission to the mechanical necessities of that particular instrument. It's a long process of just grinding it out, but that, you know, becomes the foundation for, uh, for expression. And once that, you know, just the physical part of it has become second nature, then, you know, the, the piano player is not thinking about his fingers. He's not thinking about the keys. His attention is directed to the sound and the music. And so it's like his attention is just passing through his hands, through the instruments to, to the music. And that's a real um, shift from what the beginner is doing, which is attending very, you know, very carefully to the clumsy attempts of his hand to produce a sound. Yeah, although any beginner of music, uh, especially like something like the guitar, the first thing you you notice or the first thing you feel is the uh, the callus is developing on your fingers because you're, yeah. you're it's it's also that physical tap like you're you're doing something with your body or your your fingers that they're not used to doing and you're putting a stress or doing a damage to them that that they have to toughen themselves up to be able to to I bet like a mechanic's hands and uh you know the the hands of a you know a a bass player or a guitar player they'd be I don't know uh if they'd be if you could distinguish the two one might be a little dirtier than the other but uh I bet they'd have the same same toughness to them mm. Yeah, calluses of uh, you know playing a stringed instrument are so particular. Like there's a little, one little spot on those fingertips. Yeah. Whereas like my hands are just been traumatized in every possible way. Um, speaking, speaking of starting something, I think one of the things I don't remember if you talk about it in the book, but it does seem important. Um, like being bad at something when you start strikes mm -hmm. me as something that we don't talk enough about, right? Like like the there is, I think, philosophical value in like not just learning, but like being comfortable with how uncomfortably bad you are at something at the beginning. Yeah. And that, that gets back to what we were talking about earlier of a kind of cultivated fragility that is so sort of widespread in society. So, yeah, I have two kids and, um, you know, I, I want them to have those experiences of crushing failure and ineptitude. Um, cause you know, absent those, you can have a sort of sense of yourself as, um, that doesn't match reality and it becomes a crutch, you know, and then you, any ex experience that where that self image gets punctured is then really 
painful. I think you have to experience it early on. Yeah. Although let me ask you, I didn't know you had kids. Is that was something I was thinking about in the book? Like I know you talk about people will go like, well, I don't change my own oil because my, my time is too valuable. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so they, they sort of rationalize not doing these things because the opportunity costs. I definitely get that. I, I, I have some fond memories of like just fixing fences on my ranch. And I was talking to my wife about them a while ago. And she was like, you know what I was doing while you were doing that? Uh, I was taking care of our infant, you know? Um, her point being that, like, I was sort of indulging myself, you know, fixing this mm -hmm. stuff, uh, getting yeah. back to the land, doing this task. But it's not just that there's an opportunity cost to it. There's almost kind of a selfishness to it in a, in a life where we only have so much time. So how, how do you think about that? Well, if, if opportunity cost is very real and you can't learn to do everything and get good at it such that you could do it in a reasonable amount of time. So, yeah, you have to pick your battles. Um, I guess the sort of extreme on the other side would be um, an ideal of complete uninvolvement, which... Um, you know, if you can sort of outsource every um, skilled activity to some technology or to some, you know, guest worker, uh, then I guess that facilitates, right, I mean, it's a kind of this image of freedom, but underneath the freedom is, I think, a, a sort of lack of self-awareness of your dependence on, on others, really. Um, now, of course, the fantasy of total self-reliance is just that, it's a fantasy. So you can, yes, you can try to do everything for yourself, but you know the metal of those tools was smelted in some foundry and there were miners who dug it out of the earth. So again, you have to kind of widen your field of view to take in your we are dependent uh, creatures. Uh, there was a very good book called Dependent Rational Animals by Alistair McIntyre. Well, and, and it's probably not honest, right? So we tell ourselves, well, I don't mow my own lawn because I don't have the time. Uh, and then it's like, but did the 30 minutes you save, did you spend that with your kids or did you spend that on your phone? Like, what, what are you, where are you actually spending the time that you're saving? Are you spending mm -hmm. it being present? Are you spending it being available? Or are you spending it on more, you know, digital work or more knowledge work? And that probably if we're being honest, that's where the vast majority of the, the time saving goes. Yeah. And I think we're afflicted with a bad conscience about that, a sort of time guilt because uh, we, we fuck off so much, right? Yeah. All of us. Um, whether it's on the internet. I mean, people used to complain about novel reading as this kind of feminized, soft waste of a, of a life. Um, now, I think the digital stuff is categorically different because it's designed to maximize time on device, right? The engagement algorithms. I mean, it's, it's addictive by design. So that, it gets, that gets a little sinister. So how have you thought about teaching your kids about some of these ideas as far as sort of getting their hands dirty, uh, shop classes, soul craft? How, how do you, I get how you write about it in a book for adults. How do you, how do you teach it to a, an eight-year-old? I think just by example, um, you know, just, you know, something breaks and the, hey, look at this. I've got some tools here. We can take this thing apart and and see what's going on and you know it's not it's, it's not by argument by just but just by i guess modeling a, a presumption that the world is intelligible the things we depend on can be understood if we take the effort and if we take it apart and um i mean just just yesterday so my my wife had taken our, their car up in the mountains with with chains on the tires and the, the chains came loose and took out the wheel speed sensors and a brake line. Um, anyway, she got it towed. Uh, the dealer wanted $1,300 to get it back on the road. And 
I fixed it with $75 worth of parts, you know, and it, it took about a day, but yeah, I, I sort of, I told my daughter, look, if you have tools, that's the best investment you can make. No, that's interesting. And, and I think also like the internet, is, these digital devices, they are also a tool, right? So you can use YouTube to fuck off all day and watch nonsense. There's also, I, I, this kid works for me. He does like sort of handyman tasks uh, with all my different projects. And uh, he doesn't know how to do anything, but he teaches himself how to do it from YouTube videos. I'm like, hey, can you fix this thing? Or, yeah. hey, I want you to build this for me. You know, he doesn't have any formal training in these things, but he has the tool, which is his phone, that is, uh, you know, uh, an infinitely vast library of instructions on how to do stuff. And so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of, of YouTube instructional videos. Um, and, you know, in addition to, to YouTube, you have these technical forums that grow up devoted to some very particular thing. So I'm an air cooled Volkswagen enthusiast. I'm just finishing a, a car I've spent 10 years building and you go on these forums and, you know, People are going really deep into stuff. And they're also pushing the state of the art. I mean, we're getting 10 times the horsepower out of these engines that they were designed to make. And that's it's a kind of folk engineering, as I call it, where it's, you know, because of this community sharing knowledge and sort of pushing each other further competitively out of a kind of, well, it's that spirit of play, really. Um, you know, it's the honor, I guess, of, of, of reaching certain whatever horsepower numbers or something. But it's the, the end result is a, just an extraordinary progress in knowledge. And these communities, one thing I like about them is they cultivate a deep cognitive ownership of your car, um, like all the way down, that stands in real contrast to the passivity and dependence of consumer culture. It's, it's also humbling. I, I get this experience reading books too. There's a James Baldwin quote where he says, you know, you think your pain is so special and unique and then you read, you know, you realize like, hey, other people are going through it. I, I always find it hilarious. You, your car is doing something weird or, you know, this your, your house is making some weird noise or whatever it is and you Google it. And it's like, not just one person has had this exact problem, but thousands of people have had the exact problem in the exact same way. And uh, by the way, here is the three-step solution to that thing. Yeah, it makes you, you go from feeling totally alone and miserable to, yeah, you sort of, oh, there's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole bunch of people out there going through the same thing. Yes, yes. We're all very separate dealing with the exact same problems yeah, uh, and and yeah. Google unites us. Yeah, that is a nice moment. I hadn't thought about that. Where you you feel, I don't know, it's sort of you feel almost a friendship with these people. Yes, uh, total strangers, simply because you're dealing with the same technical challenge and diagnostic obscurities and scratching your head and beating your head against the wall and. Here's some people helping out others. It's great. Yeah. And I, I think it's like, it's an important reminder to be like, this is also true for pretty much every other emotional or physical issue too. It's not just people who both have uh, all wheel drive Audis that are, uh, <laughs> that are, de that are dealing with, with the same problems. It's also people who have been dumped or cheated on or mugged or, you know, any of the terrible things that happen in life people are quietly struggling with that too. And if mm -hmm. we would talk about it or we would ask for help in the way that Googling is effectively asking for help, we'd, we'd be able to help each other too. Yeah. And that experience of community has become, you know, is, is I think is fairly elusive in real life. Yes. Uh, so we seek it out online that the facilities for, well, that's not the right word. The occasions for um, working together with other people are diminished. You know, there was this famous book you probably heard about, Bowling Alone, that documented the sort of atrophy of voluntary associations. You know, things like volunteer fire fighting crews and you know, trade unions and mutual aid societies and, of course, church um, 
congregations. So we're, we tend to be quite isolated, uh, you know, each person in his, in his house with his family and a TV or an internet connection. So that can be very sort of atomizing and isolating. Yeah, no, it, facilities actually probably is the right word, right? Because, you know, in a pri- previous life, you'd be asking that question at the VWF hall or the, uh, mm-hmm. the athletic club that you belong to or, or you know, the bowling alley, as you said. Uh, th- those Obviously, those connections can't happen at scale at the same way in some sort of local association, uh, some sort of union membership or whatever. But there did used to be those physical locations. And I, I mean, especially in California is where I grew up, is like, some of those buildings that those clubs or, you know, those um, those mason halls are like incredible, right? Or the, the, th- those, those old buildings that people would, would have to build so they could have a place to go together, you know, uh, it's far more meaningful and will have far m- more longevity than whatever group you, you set up on Facebook. One thing I, I really missed from the beginning of the pandemic was my bar, you know, <laughs> um, a pub, where I, you know, you'd see the same people every, every day, five o'clock. Yeah. And um, there's something about just the embodied presence, you know, sort of seeing regularly the same people. And they're not people you would have chosen, right? Sure. It's just some random collection based on proximity. You know, we live in the same neighborhood and so it's an unchosen association and but but there's a serendipity to that yeah exactly serendipity is i like that word it's uh yeah sort of you you just sort of throwing yourself into the world and exposing yourself to a kind of chance um uh, you know the just the the vagaries of whatever happens to be near you no, I love that. I mean, even the fact that we're having to record this remotely instead of the same room, there's something, there is something lost in, in the atomization of, uh, of how we do this stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, so it's both. It's a, it's a kind of, it's all very mediated and um, kind of distant, but then the, of course the scale and the, this kind of infinite, yeah, you, know, you can connect to just about anybody. But I, I think also exploding that horizon of, you know, what is possible and what is therefore relevant to me comes with a cost because anything um, sort of merely local and contingent and just happens to be here where I am maybe starts to look um, less appealing simply because I haven't chosen it. So we get into this mentality of, of choosing and, you know, you're always wondering what could I have chosen that would be better because it's so infinite. No, uh, what's that, that word, uh, affluenza, but you have the, the, the mm. disease of abundance, right? The disease of choice. This is true on dating apps. It's true on right. Zillow, you know, because you can see an infinite amount of better things. It makes yeah. it very hard to be content with what you have. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, this was amazing. I love the stuff, and uh, I'm so glad we got to connect. And I think this is a uh, perennial uh, amazing book, which as I'm flipping through, I can uh, talk about physical. I can see the food that I – I must have been eating some <laughs> rice when I read this book uh, 10, or, 10 or so years ago. Uh, but but I loved it, and it was, uh, it was an honor to talk. Yeah, well, it was a real pleasure talking with you, Ryan. 